Okay, great. Well, thank you for attending our May edition of the London Salesforce Marketing Cloud User Group. Um, we got some people online as well, and one person, but that's fine. You guys are here. <laughs> so you're in the right place. And thanks to Mason Frank for, first of all, for having the space, the sponsor, the food, the drinks, all the swag, help yourself to a rubber duck, hands <laughs> on your way out. And thanks for this remote clicker. So I could. You want to this? this arrow. You want to go next? Slide chart. Oh, I do, but then I'll, I won't see okay. these people here. Okay, there we go. This works now. Okay. So I'm Kerry Townsend. Um, you can find me on Twitter uh, a lot of the time. Um, I've been working with Salesforce for probably about 15 years. Um, Marketing Cloud, more so in the last five. I would have seen or met a couple of you before but not everybody so you know, it's lovely to see you all here in person and um, Jimson. Yeah so I think people know me I'm the marketing cloud uh, I don't know guru or SME as people call it anything related to marketing cloud I've been doing this since 2009 back when exact target was around I was around when the acquisition happened in 2013 so I've had a lot of exposure with marketing cloud and not just marketing cloud but with Datarama, CDP, uh, all the inspirations that go with it. So you'll see a lot of this stuff happening as we start speaking with the next couple of uh, events. Yep. Yeah. Lovely. So this is our agenda. So some announcements, that's it here. Um, release resources, and we all know that spring 2020 is coming soon. Then we'll move into the main event where we'll have our talking. Uh, and then there'll be some Q&A if anybody's got any burning questions. I can see some slight nodding, so I'm confused. Um, and then we'll wrap up. So, Jim, so first, to begin, if you want to learn about Marketing Cloud, uh, which most of us here are consultants in Marketing Cloud, I highly recommend this book. It just came out on Tuesday, I believe. It's from Greg Gifford. If you know Greg or Gorington, he's well known as in the uh, Stack Exchange space. Highly recommend this book. It's co-authored with Jason Hanshaw. Um, it's on Amazon. I don't make any money on this. This is not a plug for anybody for me. But if you really want to learn more about marketing cloud, about automations, how to use AMP script, how to use service side JavaScript, uh, this is the book to get. So here's the link on Amazon. Just search for Greg Gifford or Marketing Cloud. We're um, we're seeing a few more books now coming through with Marketing Cloud. So there's also the um, there's a B2C architect book for anybody that's using. Um, multiple clouds as well, which is really great to see in space. Uh, the spring release. Yes, spring release. Okay, so those, how many, I guess those are marketing cloud uh, orgs. Everybody here, I think you all are marketing cloud users. You know, it's that June 4th next month, we're going to have the summer release of 22. Nothing great to exist. <laughs> There's um, nothing new really to, uh, to showcase really. Uh, a couple of good ones, uh, package manager. If you're using multiple BUs and you're doing one BU config and, and you want to transfer all your components to the other BU, uh, package manager, which was called deployment manager uh, last year, some major updates to check out. Um, those who use Microsoft uh, now support Amazon S3, Amazon, and Google Cloud. Uh, now you can have Microsoft as well. So that's another update. Um, and that's about it, really. Uh, nothing much exciting. So there are some resources, uh, which hopefully everybody's got some marketing emails about so far, but just the key dates to look out for. So tomorrow uh, at 7 p.m., I'm sure everyone here is going to be uh, dining into that live. Uh, and then also the 23rd is another key date for um, some feature reviews. So we are currently looking to meet next on the 22nd of June. That will be an in-person yeah. meeting, that's the aim. Um, but some other ones that you might be interested in, so hard our meeting next week, so that's Tuesday. Yep. Here, yep. same okay. spot, yeah. So you know where you're going. Um, and then London Devs and Admins are doing some meetups uh, in the week before Salesforce World Tour. So those will be on the 15th, which is the Wednesday. Uh, and also, I think the admins is on the 14th. But if you're interested in any of those, please keep an eye on the um, Trailblazer Community Group's website where you can sign up for them. 
I'm also going to talk to you about London's Calling again. If any of you were here for the meetup last week, you'll have seen me talk about it. This event is in two weeks' time. It's sort of like a supercharged version of this. So these meetings that we have in the evening monthly are community group people talking about using the product. So this event is a supercharged version of that where people within the community have got an idea for a talk, they have submitted it, and so I think we had something like 170 submissions, and those have been whittled down and selected to approximately 60 sessions uh, that will run uh, a week, two weeks today, tomorrow, two weeks tomorrow. I'm involved in the organisation of this event, my time has <laughs> morphed into something else. Um, so this week it's at the brewery, I don't know, people may have been to the brewery before, sometimes Salesforce does the, the partner forum kickoff at the brewery, so you might have been to that. Uh, our keynote speaker is Sally Gunnell, mm -hmm. Jimson may do a better job of telling you uh, about Sally Gunnell. I got a door prize, who knows, who knows who is Sally Gunnell, anybody? She won an Olympic gold medal, which Olympics? Running. Okay. Event? <laughs> I'll take that. Run event. Good job. Good job. Uh, 10,000 meters. Close. 400 meter hurdles. Okay. What year was it? <laughs> 1992. Excellent. Yeah, that's it. Barcelona. Perfect. That Boom. was it. Boom. <laughs> Boom. Okay. Don't go away. He wins our prize. So she'll be speaking at Glenda's Calling. Highly recommend. Uh, it'll be a very inspiring talk. So yeah, be there. Amazing lady. Yeah. So she's talking about wellness and work, really, which I think is something that's all very important to us. Um, at the moment. Tickets on sale, we are expecting to sell out in the next week. We'll at least get very close to that. Uh, our wonderful yeah. <laughs> Jim will be talking about yeah. CDP. Uh, so if you have any interest yeah. in that. And also, um, Safi from the uh, Pardot user group will also be talking, but not specifically about Pardot, about um, mental fitness. So that will be a great session. We have um, a track marketing automation talk so that's part of the marketing cloud they're on the website i would encourage you to go take a look if you can't go in person maybe one of your friends would like to go um, so another event that's coming up which i'm sure i hope you've all heard about is london world tour everybody heard about london world tour yeah good great answer <laughs> that's the one right so this is um both this is a hybrid event so it's going to be in per like there's going to be a in-person element and everybody can join on salesforce plus so nobody needs to miss out. It's being hosted by Zara. We have uh, Sir Lenny Henry uh, at this event. Um, there'll be customer stories and apparently the sessions will be on demand on Salesforce Plus. Is anybody planning to go slash watch yes. Salesforce World Tour? Good, that is the right answer. Everybody's hands. <laughs> Lovely. That's what I'm after. Uh, there is also the... Um, uh, Christy, who looks after developer relations, is also running a social the night before. Uh, so that is going to be at a venue that is very close to the tower. So if you are in or around London on Wednesday the 15th, then you would like to socialise with some other community people. I think the capacity is about 80, so it's reasonably limited. But if you email Christy um, on the email address there, or come and ask me afterwards and I can give you her email address and you'd like to go for that, then do let us know. That's it. I think that's it. I think yeah. we're um, beyond the presentations. Yeah. Did you want to? No, those are all. Oh. Those are all. We, won't, we won't go through any. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We'll go back. It's all in the uh, here. It's all in help notes anyway. <laughs> okay. Lovely. So now the main event. So now, um, <laughs> any questions on events? Come to us after if you want to hear about any events. Links. Highly recommend doing some of them. Okay, uh, let me just uh, stop sharing the screen. I have stickers. Yeah. Anybody wants that's, stickers? That's for our winner over here, winner of our door prize. <laughs> okay, so let's see now. Okay, let's see. Okay, so before we start, I want to introduce um, Al Iverson. For those who, for those who've been in marketing cloud or exact <laughs> target for a long time, we all know who Al Iverson is. He is the master of deliverability. If you have any issues on SAP setup, being bounce, shared IP address, dedicated IP address, any of those issues, if you're 
emails are landing in the promotions tab and not in the main tab or, or all your Hotmail, Outlook, Microsoft, MSN, Live emails get blocked. And believe me, check your send report or marketing cloud. You'd be shocked to see how many don't get delivered. So with further ado, um, Al was a, a believe former exact target employee, which was acquired by Salesforce Marketing Cloud. And now he's the director of deliverability at Kickbox. So uh, Al, welcome. Thank you for calling in from Chicago, I believe. That's right. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Jimson. Appreciate the uh, invitation and the introduction. Can everybody hear me okay? No, actually, we're not having, we're having audio issues. Um, All right. No, we didn't test the audio before. Uh, how, do we, <laughs> how can I help? How do we? Okay. Um, what do we do now? Do we change? Um, let me, no, I don't think it's new. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Testing, testing. Give us two minutes here. No worries. Another contract, Al? Testing, testing, one, two, three. I mean, just one second, let me try. I can't hear here, it's a problem. Al, you want to give a contract? Testing, yeah. testing, one, two, three. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, um, Al, uh, sorry about the delays here. On to you. All right. Thank you, Jimson. No worries at all. Uh, hi, everybody. I am Al Iverson. As uh, Jimson said, I am Director of Deliverability Products and Services here for Kickbox a role that I've been in for just about six months. And prior to that, I was director of deliverability for Salesforce Marketing Cloud, going back a long time, good 15 years back to the old exact target days. Um, and I wasn't even one of the first employees. I was like employee number 250, but compare that to how, what, how many employees does Salesforce have now? And still pretty early on in the, in the, in the uh, growth of that, uh, of exact target. Um, so, as Jimson said, deliverability is sort of my, my world. Uh, my role here at Kickbox is uh, uh, twofold. I'm product manager for our deliverability tools suite. Touch on that a little bit here. Try not to be too salesy, but of course I do like money. So please buy stuff from us as much as possible. Um, but the other half of what I do is um, consulting, just like I did back in the Salesforce and Exact Target days. Um, I lead our deliverability services consulting efforts here for Kickbox. So we've got already got our little roster of clients that we're, we're book a business for helping clients uh, strategize on how to uh, improve deliverability, address deliverability issues, get their way back to the inbox and so forth. And so that's what I wanted to talk about today. Um, I'll try to keep it at, at a high level. I know deliverability can be a bit of a dry topic, but uh, I am definitely open to questions. Hopefully we'll have some uh, We'll definitely have time for a Q&A here as well. So um, feel free to throw them at me if you got them at, at, at any point along here. We're happy to, uh, to uh, make this as interactive as possible. So like I said, I'm talking about deliverability and what is it? Uh, some people know, some people don't, right? Deliverability is really just sort of the measure, the practice, the is it art or science? I don't know. It depends on when you ask me and what my mood is in that day. But it's all about whether or not mail is actually getting to the inbox, right? That's deliverability success is mail getting delivered to the inbox. And deliverability failures, challenges is when mail is not getting delivered to the inbox, either it's going to the spam folder or it's getting blocked outright by an ISP or anti-spam group, spam house, that sort of thing. 
what drives deliverability, what causes deliverability issues. And that's all related to reputation. What is reputation? And reputation is sort of the view that internet service providers and mailbox providers uh, take of you. It's the view they get of you based on the metrics they see uh, of the mail you're sending to try to determine whether or not you're a good sender or a bad sender in their eyes. And then so based on that, they decide whether or not you deserve to get inbox placement or not based on a whole bunch of these different metrics rolled up to either your sending IP address or domain name or both, depending on the ISP, depending on the scenario. Um, you know, think of your IP address as sort of like the, the phone number of your server that's, that's sending your mail. Um, and so that has been a longstanding sort of uh, static indicator uh, for an ISP to sort of attach stats to. Um, so they, they roll up stats based on the mail they see from a given IP address, and they look at uh, uh, the mail coming from that IP and, and use it as a determining factor, primary determining factor in a lot of cases to decide uh, whether or not they think you're a good sender or a bad sender. If you're on a dedicated IP, um, if you're sending enough volume to be in a dedicated IP, uh, you are a very much more in control of your own destiny, where it's there's nobody else sharing an IP or sharing that infrastructure. It's dedicated to you. So that reputational view that an ISP is going to get uh, from that IP address is going to be entirely based on your sending stats, your sending practices. It gets a little little uh, trickier when uh, clients on a shared IP pool or, or shared IP addresses or a pool of shared IPs because um, there are a whole bunch of people sharing a single set of infrastructure. And so if you sent on an IP address at 2 p.m., somebody else could send on that same IPS, uh, IP address at 3 p.m. to make it trickier from a deliverability perspective because those, those stats are, if they're, when, they're, when they're logged, when they're rolled up at the IP address level, um, they get kind of blended together between you and everybody else sending on that IP. So you're not as in control of your deliverability destiny that way. Um, the next bit of it there on top of that is domain level reputation. And domain reputation is a little bit newer. It took a while for domain authentication stuff like DKIM, for example, domain keys identified mail to take off and uh, come into wide usage and in the, in the sort of a, become a best common practice. And so, so now the big ISPs, you're in particular Gmail and Microsoft OLC, which is Outlook and Hotmail, uh, OLC is Outlook Consumer. Um, they look at the domain's reputation as well. Um, this is good in that it lets you sort of uh, be a little bit more in control of that deliverability destiny yourself, even if you're on a shared IP. Uh, the downside is, is that um, these, these things that roll up to the domain level metrics can be really, really touchy, really sensitive, and it can be a little trickier to uh, make sure that you get solid inbox placement. Um, a lot of the domain level stats are based on engagement as one of their sort of primary identifiers, like what mail is uh, most likely to get, mail that is most likely to get opened or clicked based on measured by the ISPs because they can see opens and clicks just as well or better than marketing cloud or any send platform can. Uh, mail that's more likely to get opened is more likely to get in the inbox. And that's because that's because ISPs in particular Gmail are very engagement centric with their spam filter, meaning they look for signs of high engagement as a as a measure to see whether or not you're a good sender. And so mail that drives more engagement, drives higher engagement, is more likely to end up in the inbox as a result of that. And that's why strategy often takes the form of subscriber lifecycle management, the guidance being try to identify sort of inactive, dead subscribers, um, addresses that are no longer responding. Um, and that, that's gotten a lot trickier later because lately because of Apple and MPP. We'll touch on that a little bit more, but you can still and probably still should um, think about when to guide clients on how to suppress uh, unengaged addresses and have sort of a plan and methodology to do that because it's still pretty important from the deliverability success perspective. Um, all of these reputation bits are feedback driven. This is all based on uh, inputs that they get from real people. Um, and you know the, who you're trying to send to, does it get to them successfully? Do they, do they respond to it? Do they respond positively by opening reading messages? Do they respond negatively by clicking the this is spam button or other stuff? Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes into this. Um, and at a high level, these are the things that make you a good sender or a bad sender. 
right? Interactions, talked about that in the last slide, a little couple slides ago, like uh, it's really all about driving high levels of engagement. That's what makes uh, the Gmails of the world think that somebody's a good sender, that people really want your mail because they can see that uh, subscribers are interacting with it. Um, high opens, high clicks, those are all interaction metrics. Um, low bounces, low bounce rate, meaning that you're sending to valid data, that addresses are verified, they're correct, and um, uh, you're not uh, just trying to send tons of mail that's going nowhere, bouncing off of uh, unknown addresses. ISPs can tell that, and that's one of the reputation metrics they look at. Um, tins click, what is a tins click? That is a That means this is not spam. So if you're, you see something in the spam folder um, and you don't think it deserves to be there because you did sign up for it, you do want it, you report, to the ISP, you click a little button that says this is not spam, or uh, tell us that this isn't spam and pull it back to the inbox. That's what TINs mean. So that's a valuable feedback metric uh, for ISPs. ISPs will do this thing where they will do like little sampling, like Gmail or Microsoft and Yahoo will both do sampling where they'll take some tiny percentage of your mail and put it in the spam folder to measure how people react to it. So if they see people pulling it back to the inbox and saying this isn't spam, that's a very good sign for you. That's a very good indicator that your mail is wanted versus if um, nobody does anything about the mail being in the spam folder, they just ignore it. Then uh, that's a bad sign. That tells the ISP that people are not very interested in that mail and it's likely to lead to broader spam folder delivery, spam folder placement. So those are the good metrics. So some of the bad metrics here right, are complaints. And what I mean by complaints, that's where you, that's the report spam button. That's, um, uh, you know, in the ISP, uh, you click the report spam or this is spam or you drag it to the spam folder. Those are all indicators to the ISP that you're saying the mail is unwanted. They take those votes um, and they decide who to vote off the island based on all of those metrics, that complaint being that top one. If people are actively un unhappy about the mail they're receiving from you, either because they didn't sign up for it, they don't want it, it's unexpected, they don't recognize you because branding's bad, any of those things all drive high complaints. And that's going to cause blocking. And that's going to cause spam folder placement. Um, and, and that's why third-party data is problematic. Is the, is the short answer. There, we'll talk more about that in a little bit too. Uh, spam trap hits. What is a spam trap, and why do you hit it? Uh, a spam trap is a certain type of bad address um, that is usually a typo version of a good address, or it might be an address that has just never been used and never existed. Uh, but somehow it's getting mail. And so ISPs and anti-spam groups and security vendors use these spam trap addresses as sort of a honeypot security methodology to see what mail lands in those mailboxes. Uh, because in a perfect world, good senders with good practices, all verifying addresses properly or using double opt-in, not buying third-party data, not trying to make up addresses, not buying stuff from you know, your contact info websites, they're not as, as likely to send mail to those honeypot, those bad spam trap addresses. So that, you know, a lot of the uh, anti-spam groups like Spam House, for example, they'll sort of stack rank um, the mail coming into their spam trap networks, networks of addresses. And uh, you don't want to be at the top of that leaderboard because if you are, that's, that's very likely to put you into, their, uh, into the crosshairs as far as you're likely to end up block listed by a spam house or other anti-spam group. So that's, uh, it, it drives home the importance of list hygiene, that uh, good, good senders tend to send to fewer spam trap addresses, preferably none, but you know, nobody is perfect and typos happen. Um, sometimes addresses get recycled. Um, so it doesn't mean that zero is the, is the only acceptable number, but it does mean that uh, you don't wanna have more than the next guy for sure. High bounce rates too. Like I said, if addresses, uh, your address attempts, your sending attempts are going nowhere, ISPs can tell that. And that's one of the metrics they look at to determine uh, a good sender from a bad sender. <clears throat> on, the, on the engagement side or the other side of engagement, low opens and low clicks as well are things that, um, uh, that indicate to the ISP that this mail isn't very wanted. Um, since you know, that what they wanna do is they only wanna deliver mail that their, that their users want. They, their, their goal is to keep their customer happy and their customer is the person with the Gmail account or the Hotmail account. And, and those the feedback they get universally from their subscriber base is they don't want spam in their inbox. They don't want unwanted mail in their inbox. And so that's the whole goal here is ISPs are using these metrics to try to make their user base happy. 
what does that translate to at a, at a high level like if there's one slide that says what is deliverability success it's really just this and at a high level these are the places where you start to understand uh what it means to send mail properly in a way that's not going to get you uh, uh into a problematic issue and not get you into the spam folder and an isp not get you blocked by a hotmail or a yahoo or a spam house it's good data first party data uh, no purchase lists, no third party data. People expect this mail. They know they signed up for it. They're not, uh, you know, signing up for one thing and then get something else from a different brand or a different sender. That's the kind of thing that's going to cause problems for you. Um, these are all the things that ISPs are looking for. Is the mail wanted and expected? And they use all of those feedback metrics that we talked about, all those little measures from interactions to complaints and, and all of that stuff to try to make a determination of, of uh, whether or not somebody merits placement in the inbox or is going to end up in the spam folder instead. Um, now, here comes the, the little bit of the sales part, but um, not too salesy, I hope. I think um, uh, Salesforce uh, has a whole bunch of smart people and a really, really robust, complicated platform. There's so much you can do with Salesforce Marketing Cloud, right? It's, it is a huge engine that can, that can power a whole bunch of machines, do a whole bunch of cool stuff. So there's data inherent in there too that's necessary to deliverability success. Um, it's not always, uh, you don't always have to go outside of the platform to start to get the necessary information to know if you are sending mail properly, if a, if a client's email marketing program is moving in the right direction or not. On the marketing cloud side, that's going to start with your send statistics, opens, complaints, uh, and bounces and clicks, all of that stuff. Um, complaints, you know, being th those those report spams from almost all of the ISPs, not all of them, but most of them actually come back to Salesforce Marketing Cloud and they get reporting. Uh, they log it all and you can get reporting like the spam complaint over time reporting. We got a link to that in a future slide here, further slide here. Um, so there's, there's a wealth of data for you inside of Marketing Cloud that's going to help you focus on what you need to do to start to be make sure that you're a good sender. On top of that, that's where we can help, where external tools can do things that the Marketing Cloud or another send platform cannot do. Specifically there, sort of the big, the big meat in the burrito is inbox placement. This is something that um, Salesforce can't tell you if your message got to the inbox or the spam folder because ISPs don't send that back. There's no status notification that says campaign number one, two, three, four got to the inbox. This is how you measure that using a seedless based inbox testing where you include our test list in sends, you send to it, we grab all the mail to our test addresses and we build a graphical report with detailed information that shows you did your mail go to the inbox, the spam folder or not get delivered at all. That's an, that's an important measure of inbox success. Um, now you can, you look at uh, things like open rates. If you have a high, high open rate, you probably got solid inbox placement, right? Um, but those get trickier um, to try to back into it that way over time. You look at how Apple's MPP has sort of blown up uh, tracking, open tracking detection and, and grossly inflated opens. Um, and even if you, if you remove all of that data from your data view, then you're just, left with a um, much smaller view, much more imperfect view of open rates. So inbox placement can help. That's really, the goal there is to mod monitor and understand where mail is actually going, getting delivered at the ISPs for that final step, right? The final mile after, after Salesforce hands the mail off to the internet service provider. Um, we have block list monitoring, so we can monitor your IPs and domains to make sure there's no block list issues there comes with our guidance on which ones we think matter. There's a whole bunch of them. Uh, there's 90 plus block lists out, out in the world. And a lot of them don't, um, uh, are not broadly used. Um, well, frankly, a lot of them don't matter, um, but which ones do matter and we can guide you on that. We also have pre-checked, which is a rendering tool uh, akin to a, a litmus or email on acid. Um, so you can do render tests to make sure that everything's gonna uh, uh, render beautifully in different email clients. Um, it also has some spam checking, uh, proactive sort of pre-send, pre-flight spam checking components to that as well. So you can test it before you actually do a send. <clears throat> we have DMARC monitoring. DMARC's a bit of a security thing where you, um, you tell the world, hey, don't accept mail from me if it pretends to be my domain, but it doesn't authenticate properly. So if you set up DMARC properly, you can uh, get a, a pretty good indirect deliverability benefit in that you don't 
Uh, you don't have the ability, bad guys don't have the ability to sort of spoof your domain and pretend to be you and harm your sending reputation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Last bit there is uh, email verification. Um, and what email verification does is it helps you verify addresses as they come in on the front end so that you can ensure that the data you're sending to is as clean as possible. Um, with clean data is another way to sort of uh, mitigate or prevent deliverability issues. And again, bouncing around a little bit here, there, there's useful stuff here in Salesforce Marketing Cloud, right? With email performance by domain, spam complaint reporting, you know, you can get raw bounce information, which will have detailed troubleshooting information um, in bounces that is not normally in the UI. You can get it from support or you can get it with a special thing, uh, query from Automation Studio. <coughs> Excuse me. But again, it doesn't tell you everything. It doesn't tell you inbox placement. It doesn't tell you if your email is configured correctly as far as you know, your SAP set up properly for sender authentication package and DKIM authentication, all that stuff. So Kickbox and even our little free tool, KBX score um, at kbxscore.com that can help with that as well. Um, and uh, it, uh, just a tiny bit more on the verification bit of it. Um, what does verification do? It just tries to take an address and tell you, is that address uh, good or not? And in fact, I'm going to just go live here to the uh, link. If I can exit full screen. I'm trapped in full screen. Here we go. I will do, we'll go live right over to Kickbox here. We can see my account. Let me show you most of this stuff here. Actually, I'm going to do it in a different tab here. So um, I actually am a verification user myself. My friend runs a jazz club that actually closed a few years ago. Um, and after a few years of not sending, we decided to resurrect the email list and just send fun stuff to it, little information on, you know, cool new jazz records or a little bit of jazz history, that sort of thing. Maybe we send one to three emails a month, nothing fancy. But I wanted to uh, mitigate the risk of resurrecting a three, three year dead email list. Um, and so, um, we used uh, Kickbox to verify to see what's the current state of all these addresses. It's one good thing you can do with it, push legacy data through it to try to identify what's gone bad over time, try to minimize deliverability challenges. Um, and so it, it can be just as simple as you upload a CSV. We recognize the, uh, the email address column. We verify and categorize it. We'll give it a Sendex score. So each address will have a score from zero to one to determine uh, higher, higher being better. So it helps you determine if you think an address is safe to send or not. Give you a bunch of category information too if you really want to get granular and do fancy stuff with it. You can download all of this and it'll, it'll append additional fields with all those. In fact, when you go to download, you can say, hey, I want all the results or I just want the best of them so I don't uh, accidentally send to uh, questionable addresses. You can kind of pick that there too. Also has an API where you can... Uh, um, do live calls if you want to integrate it into an external website and actually do a verification before you ever load something into Marketing Cloud, do an API call and you get the same information back, um, including if we can tell what did the subscriber probably mean to type, we'll say, did you mean? And then you can actually visually offer that back to the subscriber and say, give them a chance to sort of live correct the ad address. And we get a lot of technology on the back end that tries to figure out a good address from a bad address. Uh, at some level, of course, the, the core of it is reaching out to a mail server and doing a little interaction with it to uh, make sure it's a good or bad. Uh, but there's a lot of other bits behind there too, just you know, data caching and, and a lot of categorization of different domains and addresses that we have um, and uh, other bits and bobs that are sort of proprietary behind the scenes bits that, uh, that help to ensure that we verify uh, your data as much as we can. Because no, 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 nothing like this is going to be perfect. There's vendors out there that'll tell you, oh, yeah, use our verification tool. We'll tell you where all the spam traps are. And you'll never email a bad address again. And they're, they're probably full of beans. I don't think that's actually possible to know where every spam trap address in the world is. Uh, but they do say that. So that's the, that's the, uh, the verification bit of it. Um, and as I said, I'm the product manager for our deliverability tool suite. Um, which is that inbox uh, placement testing that I was talking about here, where I look, you know, to look at a result here. I was just testing that. So that's a failed one because I'm doing product testing, but I can go down to one of these results. We'll go, let's find with some spam folder problems. There's a Salesforce send with a spam placement issue. But I, I can click down on this report, right? And I get results at a high level. Let's say a little pie chart tells me what percent went to inbox, what went to spam. Then I've got detailed ISP level results for all of these. So I can see I went to the spam folder at Hotmail, 
<clears throat> get tracking information here on a, on a per test address at uh, level uh, that'll show you did everything authenticate properly. If I need to get uh, raw messages back so that I can um, uh, troubleshoot it, submit it, send it, submit it with a help ticket either to Microsoft or to Salesforce, whatever, I can get that right out of there. Um, and you get detail all the way down. Got a whole bunch of ISPs in there. Um, it's not every ISP in the world. It's not always easy to set up all these ISPs for testing, uh, especially when they're in uh, far off uh, lands and don't always let you uh, log in unless you have a local cell phone number. But we've got a lot of them around the world um, and lots of different ISPs and we keep adding more monthly. We're also um, adding an integration here with, with Marketing Cloud. Um, and if you have been around a while, you might remember the return path integration with Marketing Cloud, where it will uh, it would upload your seed list automatically and automatically include it in sends, the auto seeding function. Um, and that's what we've got here. This is just about ready to go. You can see I've got it turned on in my account for testing. Uh, it needs, uh, I, I, I need to give it a a uh, couple days more polish before we're ready to release it to the wild, um, but it's very close to being done. It does actually work. It automatically manages your seed, your partner seed list, deliverability seed list inside of Marketing Cloud, lets you set the threshold for uh, auto seeding. If you want to turn that on, you can, and we'll push that information up to uh, Marketing Cloud automatically. So that's pretty cool. Um, there's also, like I said, block list monitoring. We can put in IPs and domains. And it'll tell you if it finds a block listing issue. The IP side of it is kind of more helpful for uh, uh, if you're on a dedicated IP. If you're on a shared IP, it's kind of more on Salesforce to, to monitor those shared IPs because it, you, you, don't, um, you don't have full control over them. So if you, if you see somebody doing something bad on there, you can't really do anything about it because you don't know who else is sending or who the other clients are. But Salesforce can. And so that's one of the things that they be responsible for. Uh, but you can monitor your domains. And you can monitor dedicated IPs. Got pre-check testing too. Like I said, this is like that litmus or email on acid. You get your grid of renders. Get some spam checks in here as well. Um, like I said, these are sort of the pre-flight before you send uh, spam checks. Um, it's good because it gives you a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of spam checks to spam filters to check all at once. And uh, that can be pretty helpful. Um, the uh, last bit of it here is the DMARC that I was talking about where you can track whether or not all your mail is authenticating properly. Uh, based on these reports, you can see who out there in the world is trying to send as you. In my case, I'm mostly good. This is this is all stuff I expect. My hosted server, I use G Suite. Uh, but then I start to dive into some of these other results, and I can see this is one of my dummy test domains, um, and I don't actually send any mail at all with that domain. But somebody is. Um, somebody's trying to send mail with that domain. So if this was a client uh, client's domain and I was guiding them on how to set up DMARC, I'd say, hey, it's probably time for you to increase that uh, security setting, that policy setting for DMARC to um, tell the world to block mail from this domain if it doesn't really authenticate as coming from me properly. Because in this case, somebody is out there trying to pretend to be that domain. You can also uh, handle BIMI logos. Um, and uh, BIMI logo is a little sender avatar, a little sender icon that goes along with email messages in, uh, in Gmail and Yahoo and fast mail, not Microsoft, unfortunately. Uh, Comcast and a few others are coming soon there though too. Um, so that's the deliverability suites of bits of it. Uh, I wanted to sort of uh, highlight that this is really sort of, um, this is monitoring. This isn't gonna magically fix a deliverability issue for you. It's a very good smoke detector if I do say so myself. Um, but when it comes to uh, what do you do when you run into issues? Um, you know, at a, you know, um, at a high level, we talked about what are some of the best practices for how to ensuring that you minimize the chances for deliverability issues, right? And so, if you run into trouble, it comes down to improving data, improving engagement, adjusting your your sending strategy and segmentation, um, or if you get stumped and you're just not sure what to do with that, uh, we can help. Uh, we can do and often do deliverability consulting for clients. So we can do a paid services engagement, either with myself or my colleague, Jennifer uh, Lance. Both of us have uh, 15 plus years deliverability uh, expertise in this realm. And so we can guide you back on the right path if need be. Um, my last little bit here is if you want to learn more about uh, BIMI logos and what all that means, what is a sender logo avatar, whatever, um, uh, we are actually going to do a webinar next week, uh, specifically focused on that. Um, what are the, you know, what ISPs use it? Why do you want to use it? Um, uh, how do you 
what's the right way to save a logo? How do you upload it into our tool? How do you set it up in your DNS record? What's the backup way to do it at Gmail? A bunch of other fun stuff too. Um, and I'll give Jimson a copy of the slide deck too to share it around with folks if you would like to do that. Um, and that is pretty much all I had. If you have questions uh, now or later, I'm happy to chat now if folks want to save some time for a QA. and a um, Otherwise, if you want to follow up, if you've got questions about any of this, you can always reach out to me, Al, at kickbox.com. And uh, <clears throat> away we go. Great. Am I muted? Yeah, great, Al. Thank you very much for a comprehensive overview of this. I'm just getting a microphone set up here. Um, I have a lot of questions because I've been doing this for 13 years, but I'm sure the audience here has just as many questions. So, um, so I'll leave it to the audience first. Anybody have a question? Just speak loud. This picks up like 20 feet. Anybody have a question in the audience about what Al talked about or what your issues are with email? Anybody here? Nobody? Is it going to be me asking all the questions? Okay, question over here. Uh, hang on, Steve. Okay, Steve, can you hear me? Yeah. So when we have a transactional email API and dedicated IP address for that, um, should we somehow warm it up uh, specifically if it's the IP address dedicated to transactional emails? Or um, we assume that transactional emails are rather expected, uh, like confirmations, etc. cetera, so uh, the address will warm up with the time. Uh, I would assume you have to warm it up just as if it were a marketing IP um, because you're worried. Uh, uh, the point of warming is to try to avoid filtering based only on an explosion of volume. So that's the, that's the concern. Um, so but the, the exception of that would really be volume related. Like if you're only sending a few thousand transactional messages a day, that's a relatively low enough number that it does sort of warm itself, like you were thinking. So, but if, it, if it's going to go immediately to, you know, a million messages a day, then if at all possible, I would still try to treat it like a warming and, and start out uh, limiting the volume day by day and slowly building up over time. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? Anybody have questions? Wow. Okay. Let me just turn it this way since I'll be asking all the questions here. Um, okay. Can you hear me, Al? Mm -hmm. Okay. So in Gmail, you have your primary tab, you have an update and promotion tab, and you're doing your IP warm up, and the email lands in the primary tab in your IP warm up. The minute you send a mass email to 20,000 people, it goes into the promotions tab. Any advice on how to solve that problem? Yeah, it can be tough because it's a black box and, and uh, Gmail tries very hard to prevent people from, from sort of reverse engineering what's going on behind there. So um, I would say my guidance really is along the lines of the promotions folder is truly the inbox, the, the, the feedback from Google and the data from tests from, from Litmus, from Return Path, uh, now Validity and a bunch of others have been shown that they think the interactions, opens and clicks um, tend to be just as high for promotions tab versus primary inbox. The problem there is, you know, if you, if you want to, you, you, can, you can assuage, you can adjust your content to try to stay out of the promotions tab, make it less, you know, make it less marketing focused, make it less salesy. But, but the things that recognized it, uh, that made Gmail recognize it as promotional are the things that make it sell well for you. So it's, it's, you don't really want to gut the um, the marketing nature of the message because it, while that will then get you more likely to get to that primary tab, primary placement, it's going to uh, inter it's going to reduce your ability. Uh, it's going to reduce the, the chances of a higher click rate, right? It, you're, you're sort of you're dulling your call to action uh, is is really the way to do it, and it's kind of a double edged sword. I, I frankly I I stand by that if you're in the promotions tab, um, if you're doing everything right, you're still going to get a high level of opens and clicks. Right, okay. And I guess that goes the same with uh, Outlook and the other tab as opposed to Focus. Same that way. one, that one's a little trickier, I think. Um, the, the good thing there is that um, the last data I saw, it didn't sound like um, that was that widely adopted. I don't exactly know where the numbers are, are on that today. Um, I, you know, Good news is Outlook's a much smaller platform, uh, especially in the B2C realm. Uh, I don't know about the UK, but in the US, very small. They're, you know, they're number 
three or four at this point behind, you know, Yahoo and Gmail and a few and a couple others. Um, but um, that's a little trickier. I think um, Outlook is tr it, it tries to do the 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 other or focus sort of based on your interaction. So there's, there's not really as much you could do to sort of override it because in theory, it's based on a, a per subscriber basis as whether or not you've chosen to interact with it or not. Similar thing in Gmail is when you get the little pop-up that says, hey, you haven't, uh, you, you haven't clicked on an email from you know, xyz.com in three months. Do you want to unsubscribe? You know, that, they're looking at um, engagement metrics. So, so really the way, the, the way to, to try to minimize the chances of that are to have a, an engagement focused segmentation strategy so that you don't mail unengaged addresses forever. You'll, you'll find other uh, marketing strategists out there who there's at least one guy who loves to say, email every address forever, don't ever suppress something because it's unengaged. And you know he's got an opinion on that and it's, it's crap. You have to suppress addresses that never open or click or you run into problems like, inbox versus spam folder placement or inbox versus other out of focus placement. A lot of companies use Outlook for their email client. A lot of consultancies, a lot of B2B people use Outlook. So um, surprise that hasn't been a big issue because I, I, I've had clients uh, beg me to get emails sent to the focus tab, not the other tab in Outlook. And you just can't, right? Because it's a black box. So anyway, yeah, and yeah, it might be a little bit regional uh, because um, over here, I get nothing but begging for help about Gmail problems. Uh, the, uh, Microsoft is a, a sticky wicket, don't get me wrong. They, they are sort of the quickest to block out of all the ISPs. But the, 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 the problems the, that I have with clients that they, they really need help, it's all Gmail focused. So I, haven't, I, I couldn't tell you the last time I had, had somebody really uh, frustrated for, for, that, uh, for the specific Outlook placement. Yeah. Okay. Um, any questions in the in the audience? Get one question in the audience. Um, a lot of like your security. Sorry, two questions. Um, is there any point in the um, How often should we be doing it? Um, that little chair squeak or desk squeak in the middle of that meant I couldn't hear it. Could you repeat it? So first question is. Is there any point in seed listing? If so, how often should you be doing that? Yeah, um, seed list testing. Um, I do think it's valuable. It, it all depends on your target audience and um, how often you send, how big your, your subscriber base is, or really what your segmentation strategy is. Um, is seed list testing is fantastic to help monitor for deliverability issues for B2C specifically. It's it, as as Jimson alluded to his question about Outlook there, um, it gets a little trickier with B2B because B2B is uh, a lot more of a diffused environment. It's not as um, specific to only, you know, six or eight providers like the B2C realm is. So um, it's a lot harder to get a broad measure of deliverability for B2B with inbox testing. So short answer, yes, with the asterisk that if it's B2B, it's you know, not, not as comprehensive. Now, how often, again, you have the other part of your question there, is really uh, going to depend on what you're doing, right? You think, um, you know, uh, we had to think about this because we have the structure, how many tests go with an account at a, at a certain level. Um, and, you know, so the default provisioning there for us is 40 tests a month uh, for a, a, an inbox placement account in, in Kickbox. And the reasoning there is really just sort of think of, uh, you know, if you're a really, you're doing a ton of sending that lets you do, um, one or two tests every day it might give you a little bit of wiggle room. If you think of it more doing it on business days, not, not weekends, right? So it gives you a, um, an opportunity to do up to one or more tests a day. But, excuse me, if you don't have a, a very deep segmentation strategy, uh, you probably don't have to do it every day. Like if you, don't, if you don't have a bunch of IPs and domains, which are, those are really the things you're trying to test the deliverability of with an inbox placement test. So if it's... Um, if it's all the same IP and demand, you, you're probably going to be fine with once or twice a week, um, maybe even once every two weeks. If you're not really in a bad place, you're not not, not trying to recover from a from a deliverability issue. So so it can it can, it can vary pretty significantly. It's almost it's almost um, you know you, we don't really it's sort of like um, you got to think of it like if it was a medical thing and you were trying to think how often should I check my pulse or check my blood pressure, right? And it kind of depends on your situation, like. 
I'm on 13 different medications. So I check my blood pressure twice a day, every day. Um, but most people don't have to. I'm in a unique situation. Any other questions? Any other questions? One second. So obviously deliverability is can be very complex and you can really get into it. But if you were talking to someone that's relatively new to an organization, say it's day one, you've taken over a marketing org, what would be the first like three things you would get someone to do or check to get some sort of idea of how they would do, like how that organization is doing? Yeah, sign up for your own list. Um, don't buy data and don't follow bad advice. And specifically number three there, what I'm thinking of is, you say, well, but everybody does it. I, I get spam every day in my work inbox. Well, you know what? It's it, 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 people steal cars every day too. That doesn't mean you, you've, I've seen somebody steal a car on our street. It doesn't mean that that's good advice to go out and start stealing cars. You, you can see them sending unwanted mail, but what you cannot see is the after effects and fallout from it. You know, the poor, from starting from poor response rates up to they got kicked off of their send platform or, or, uh, block list of buy spam house. So that's my first three, I think, if you want to put a number of them. But people still send transactional mail, even though it's commercial, right? I, I, you know, as a registered partner in Salesforce, I get tons of email from offshore companies asking, do you want consultants? Do you, we can provide, do you want to buy lists of all the people who use marketing cloud? I mean, you should be surprised how many transactional mail I get. And it always says in the bottom, if you do not want to uh, receive any more mail from me, click here and you know, so on and so forth. I mean, I won't say, is this not legal? Well, no, it's not legal, but it's not good practice what these people are doing. So, so the question is, is, is sending transactional mail, even though it's commercial, still a good practice or, or, or what should they do? Or what should I do? Well, define transactional. I mean, tra transactional in act, for, for my context, an email would mean, um, related to, you know, it's an order confirmation or password reset or something like that. So it's not a transactional message if it's somebody who's never had, uh, uh, never worked with you before. There's there's actually, you know, a lot of the ones where they say, do you want to buy a list of Salesforce decision makers? Um, there's actually, most of that is one single company in India called Sloan or Data Champions. Um, that is sort of a notorious spam gang that, you know, they just send out millions of it and they occasionally trick people who don't know any better. Once in a while, somebody pays $99 for, for some garbagey list and gets in trouble when they send to it. And so again, you see, the, you see one side of that equation, you don't see the back end or, or exactly how successful they are. Yeah, it's the same as uh, people asking to be a guest writer on our blog and every single person is a Gmail user. Yeah. <laughs> so here's a famous well-known guest writer who's written all these fancy websites but their, their email address is Gmail. So, you know, I bet they've been kicked off, you know, <laughs> or bumped off from domain to domain. Um, yeah, so, so in Marketing Cloud, you have a choice of sending from commercial or transactional email. Is there like mm -hmm. a danger in using transactional email, even though you know it's not commercial? Because some people well, do it. Some people do that. Sure. Uh, the... the um, in the U.S., there's a pretty clear delineation under the law for when it's okay to send, send basically to send as a transactional message, as we're using the transactional message definition. Um, and, it, and there's a, a pretty easy standard under can spam. And in fact, even, um, you know, this will probably be tiny little type on there, but if you go to spam resource on my blog here and just down here was uh, just from the other day, what constitutes a transactional message? Jimson, if you remember Chip House, who used to work at Exact Target, uh, he yeah. sort of helped. He and I sort of ghost wrote this together because it came up at a question that uh, he's now uh, CMO at Insightly CRM. So he and I worked on this together, um, and there is um, uh, a pretty good definition in Can Spam of when it, when it's okay to send a transactional message. The, the 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 sort of the core of it is it's okay to send trans transactional messages even to people who have unsubscribed from marketing messages, as long as the focus of the message is transactional related, like it's your order confirmation, it's about your employment, it's about to fulfill your subscription, it's about um, you know anything that's specific, like reset your password, anything that's very specific to your um, mon monetary entanglement, if you will, you know, with, with a specific company. So in, in that case, it's okay to do that. It gets a little trickier. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're 
Um, it <laughs> include a lot of uh, marketing specific content in there. And then it gets a little blurrier and it's kind of iffy and there's, there's sort of competing guidance on what's okay or not. Uh, but if, for the US bit of it, it's sort of the, what's the primary purpose of, of the messages sort of defined by a normal person's view of it. Canada gets a little bit different. Canada uh, treats it as if you even have a drop of marketing content, you can't send it to uh, people who have, uns who have unsubscribed. Um, so it, it, can, it can vary a little bit, but you, you know, the, the core of it is, is if it's, if, if it's somebody who is an actual customer who's buying something from you, and this is to relate to the fulfillment of that purchase, then it's definitely okay to send it. Okay. Any other questions? One more back. Uh, one second. I'll just turn the mic to her. On the slide where you have the good and bad things to do, um, good yeah. things being, um, open, slow bounces. Yeah, so with after the iOS changes, did the importance of high opens drop and did that distribute evenly across um, the others? Is there any of them that are more important than any others? So um, Apple's recent changes, their, their MPP, the uh, male privacy stuff, um, made that a lot tougher. So um, and, and it affects multiple ISPs. It's not just people that use iCloud email addresses. Because if you're using Apple Mail on, on iOS on your phone, on your Apple iPhone, um, you um, are behind this new MPP filtering or proxying it, whether or not you use a Gmail account, a Microsoft account, a Yahoo account, or, or an Apple email account. So it's tough. It's sort of, it inflates opens for everybody. Um, and probably the best things to do there are twofold. And that's number one, uh, keep very gently complaining to Salesforce that they need to make it easier to identify those opens so that you can exclude them. Um, that's what other platforms do. Um, I don't know that that's very commonly done in marketing cloud today. I know the data is in there somewhere, but uh, I don't know that it's very well exposed to the customer. Um, and then, then try to exclude that from, from your measurements where you can. Now, um, it, so it, what this screws up is it, it, if even before any of this happened, there, there was sort of a hierarchy of which ISPs were better with opens or, or what, what's best to look at. And, and at least in the US B2C side of things, it was always Gmail, Yahoo, Microsoft in that order. Um, and it was, that's always Gmail had the highest opens, Yahoo had the slightly less opens, and Microsoft had even fewer opens for the same mail to the same type of subscriber base. So some of it is strangely inherent to the, the receiving platform in a way that you wouldn't expect. So um, that's a consideration as far as which ones to look at. And so everybody mostly looks at Gmail as sort of the gold standard. And if you're really if you're trying to uh, design a marketing program in a way to minimize deliverability issues, if you focus it based on Gmail data, everywhere else is probably going to be good. Um, so, so that, that's probably where, where I would focus on. But again, you know, with the Apple MPP stuff, it it, it gets a little squirrely as far as um, what uh, how to know how open your how accurate your opens are. The good thing is, right, is that they're still sort of directionally valid, right? You can see, you know, ups and downs over time, even with all the Apple sort of pre-loading stuff built in, still can't use it direct for directional trending, but it is not as exact as it once was. And that's a bummer for sure. Questions? I have one. So Al, back to your, 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 your mailing list with the jazz subscribers. Yeah. Um, let's say, let's say, let's say, let's say you haven't sent an email like in three years and uh, would you still send to those people who you haven't sent in three years? Would you still send an email to that list? Is it even risky to send it to that list? It was risky for me to do that. What worked out in my favor is um, I had the same consistent branding and it was very specific to um, the club. And that in my case, they were all double opt-ins to begin with. Um, so that those are all things that help minimize the risk. But even with that, I still had some risk and I still had a handful of spam complaints and got blocked at one of the cable ISPs here as a result of that. It's fixable. Thinking that, that uh, you reach out to them, you ask them to reset it, you say, Oh, we're sorry. We're going to unsubscribe anybody who complains. It should be good now. Um, but yeah, there's a little bit of risk there. So if it's at um, the other thing that worked out in my favor is a small volume. Look at look at the deliverable there. So that's you know the list of 1,700 people, not not uh, 1.7 million. Um, I, if it's bigger and it's more commercial stuff, that's where testing 
and li rate limiting both come into play significantly, right? Do take if 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 it is two million, take a ten thousand sample and send it out over two three days and see what the results are there. Does it did it cause any blocking? Um, are well, how high is the bounce rate? Um, how high is the complaint rate? That sort of thing. Um, and then if it passes muster, if it doesn't seem to be causing problems, excuse me, then I'd probably trickle the rest of it out, you know, breaking it up into chunks and doing it over time instead of immediately doing a, a blast to 2 million people that haven't heard from me in three years. You could always use send throttling for that, couldn't you? Instead of having to do a test or would you still do a small test first and then throttle the rest? Yeah, I would definitely do a test and give yourself uh, some time in between to uh, to be able to measure results. You do, if you do send throttling, um, you know, then you've got a send in progress that you've got to figure out how to cancel versus, uh, you know, do a, do a segment and then see what the results are. And then, yeah, when you're sending the big rest of it, you could potentially do it, do a throttle. Yeah, it depends on how big. If you're talking millions and millions, it might be better to just have separate segments over separate days instead of relying on a throttle to try to trickle something out over, you know, seven days. I'm not even sure if the marketing cloud throttling can do multiple days or not. I don't think I've tried it that, ever tried to do, you know, something over two weeks instead of over 12 hours. So I think the lesson learned here, I think is, um, you know, let's say you have a, a leak on the floor, you can either mop the leak or you can fix the leak, right? Two things. So. Wouldn't it make sense to just focus on your lead quality first? Like, let's say you have a web form with just one field, your email address, very low quality web form, uh, you know, free PDF download here. You don't care for the name. You don't care for anything. I mean, people could just, and you're not using double opt-in. You might get a lot of garbage email addresses like steve at apple.com, you know, or all that kind of stuff. So wouldn't it make sense to just focus on how are you getting those leads or emails in the first place in the marketing plan? Absolutely. Um, and I know Steve at apple.com. It's not that Steve, it's a different one. And he gets a ton of spam. And uh, that's how I got to meet him because people were putting his address in our forums uh, back when I worked for a different company in, in Minnesota called Digital River. Um, and we had to put uh, verification and double opt-in in front of those forums because we, we would have a name field and then we would send people uh, emails to that. So we unintentionally sent a lot of email that said, dear dog shit. So it's really, if you're not verifying what's coming in, somebody's going to put something unhappy and uncool into there and that's going to cause problems for you. Yeah, so this is really more like an art than a science or an art and a science to get it right, in my opinion. Getting emails to the right time, the right people. Um, that's, that's my opinion. Okay, um, any other questions? Carrie? Um, well, one more question. Back here, back to the same person asking all the questions. Other than me. <laughs> um, what if you get binds um, where it's the domain blocking you, not the person? How, how do you unblock that? Really depends on which one. And um, so um, a lot of the time, your first stop might be to Salesforce support to see if you can foist it off on them to help because that they have a whole team of deliverability people that that is supposed to be their area of expertise is to track that kind of stuff down for you. Um, if you look, some of the ISPs, some of the domains um, will have very straightforward, hey, here's where you go to unblock uh, pages like Microsoft will have that or Gmail has a bulk sender submission form. But for some of them, when it's a company, you don't always necessarily know, right? And so, um, for example, um, if it's my my personal little domain is Wombat Mail, but let's pretend Wombat Mail is a company who hosts mail for Wombat Mail. What do I do if I'm blocked at Wombat Mail? Well, I can look up the MX record, the, the, which is the mail exchange DNS for a domain to see who hosts that mail, who handles that mail. So you can see that I'm a Google G Suite customer. So that can kind of give you a tip. It doesn't necessarily tell you exactly where to go, but it can tell you what to Google next to say, oh, I'm blocked at Google, I'm blocked at Google or Gmail because of that. This is what this suggests. So then I need to sort of um, start searching for what is the best practice for dealing with the Gmail bot, right? If it's Microsoft, it would be, you know, if you go to, um, for example, you look it up and it says outlook.com, you know, it would be Microsoft. There's a couple different forms. Um, like, my, so if you looked up the company, you saw it said something outlook.com, that's Microsoft Office 365. And they've got a little uh, unblock form there. So again, it really depends on which one. Sometimes it'll be, there's a company called Proofpoint that's very big in that space as well. 
Um, and when you when you find info and if you still don't know what to do, again, that's a good time to lean on, you know, a Salesforce deliverability consultant for help and see if they can help guide you in the right direction there. Um, I'm not hearing you guys. Everybody still out there? Well, I'll hang out here for a second. Okay. Greetings. Yeah, sorry about that. Let's start again. Um, <laughs> I think we're all almost wrapped. Was there any more questions here? I was just yeah, this, yeah, just that last question. Can you repeat that last question more time? Um, so when you look at the bias data view, I can't remember the category, but when it says that the domain blocked you and not the person, how, how would you go about that? So it's going to depend on, frankly, unfortunately, it's going to depend on which domain. Um, and so in when it comes to company domains, it's a lot more of a diffused environment. There's not just a sort of a single place to go. Sometimes you have to do a little bit of investigative research to try to figure out where that might be. Like if, if it was, if you were trying to send to my domain, Wombat Mail, for example, if you got a domain block there, you could try to figure out who hosts mail for Wombat Mail. That's where there's a there's a setting in DNS for all domains called MX or mail exchange lookup. And so I could use a tool like this is my little DNS tools website at XNND. There's other ones, MX toolbox and a bunch of tools that can do this for you, but plug in the domain and see what the results are. So this tells you that in my case, the host for my email for that domain is, is Google, is Gmail. So that doesn't necessarily tell you now what to do because it's Gmail, but at least you got one step closer to which company is actually behind the mail. Then you have to sort of figure out, you know, where to go next. And for example, you know, Gmail has a sender submission form. <coughs> they don't usually block very much like this, though. So but it's more often to find that for Microsoft. You look up, you'll see if it'll, it'll say Outlook.com in those results instead of Google.com. And then you have to even perhaps you search on Google for how do I request unblocking from Microsoft uh, Office? And they, then you'll find that they have their own sort of website where you fill this out. So if you, in, in your example, if it was a Microsoft hosted company domain, you trace that back to say, oh, it's Microsoft. And, and you would either have to search or hopefully get help from your friendly neighborhood Salesforce deliverability consultant to go, to know to go to this website when you have a, a Microsoft specific issues. So it, it's a little tricky. There's lots of steps there. So. Uh, you know, sometimes it's Microsoft, sometimes it's Proofpoint, sometimes it's um, uh, Vade Retro. There's a lot of companies in that space. It's not quite as simplified as sort of the consumer mailbox space. Thank you. Great. Any questions for Al? Anybody else? No, once, twice. Okay, well, Al, thank you very much for attending for a great presentation. I'm not sure the recording worked because we got cut off and lost connection. So uh, worst case, we can just have a smaller 20 minute webinar down the road if we have to repeat it down the road if we have to. Uh, so I want to thank Al for coming, uh, Ian from Kickbox for coming, uh, Mason Frank for hosting food, drinks, uh, and everything. Um, Carrie, some final thoughts here. Just recap of some of the upcoming events. Please, uh, please. Please come. <laughs> Can you send us all of these links? Yes. So they, how I typically done that is that the, so the slide deck, which has got all the links in it, I load it onto LinkedIn and SlideShare and then put a link to that in the community group. So if you know yeah. which group I'm in, it's like that. Yeah. I mean, the Trailblazer group. The, the, the one how we came here. Yes.
Yeah. Oh, yes, no, no, yes, so I can put it in there as well. Yeah. I can put, I, I can. Yes, yes, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a there's this group here on Trailblazer, and then there's the the virtual one that was the original Trailblazer group. There are two different Trailblazer so groups. On trial trailblazer where the community has come together and you can get in groups. There's that one. Plus there's you know Trailblazer community groups where you actually sign up. So I'll make sure I link it as well. Okay. Yeah. Want to get some swag away from I, I mean, I can door prizes yeah. here. I, I can't, Sorry. no, I'm not going to call these prizes. I have some stickers if people would like stickers. <laughs> Four students have stickers, but I have some stickers. <laughs> thank you. Great. Lovely. And again, thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for coming. I uh, appreciate it. I'll see you. Well, Al. Yeah, yeah, Al, thank you. And um, Wednesday, Wednesday, June 22nd, should be the next meetup at PWC. For London Bridge. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Al. We'll see you online. <laughs>